Hi, I'm Mark Brumley, president of Ignatius Press, and I'm here with Father Joseph Fessio, founder and editor of Ignatius Press, and we're going to talk about Pope Benedict XVI's surprise resignation. I'm going to start, Father, by asking you, was it a surprise? Uh, yes and no. It was a surprise in the sense that we didn't know when it might happen, but uh, he had already given a signal pretty strongly back in 2010 that he thought a pope could resign. In fact, may I read the passage sure, from this wonderful book, which I'm sure you'll have in your bookshelves, okay. Light of the World, by Peter Zavold. On page 29, Zavold is talking about the abuse crisis, all right? And he says, the great majority of these cases took place decades ago. Nevertheless, they burden your pontificate now in particular. Have you thought of resigning? Mm -hmm. Here's his answer, very good answer. When the danger is great, one must not run away. For that reason, now is certainly not the time to resign. Precisely at a time like this, one must stand fast and endure the difficult situation. He's a courageous man. That is my view. One can resign at a peaceful moment or when one simply cannot go on. But one must not run away from danger and say that someone else should do it. So then, follow-up question on page 30 from Sebald. Is it possible then to imagine a situation in which you would consider a resignation by the Pope appropriate? Ratzinger's answer, always short, clear, concise, yes. If a Pope clearly realizes that he is no longer physically, psychologically, and spiritually capable of handling the duties of his office, then he has a right, and under some circumstances, also an obligation to resign. So that's in 2010, in the fall, he's given an interview, I guess it was in July, to, to uh, Peter Zabel. But clearly, while Pope Benedict is very traditional in the terms of following the teachings and traditions of the church, he's also a creative thinker, someone who can surprise you. And in this case, clearly, he thought this was for the benefit of the church. He didn't want to be Pope, we know that. He accepted it for the sake of Christ and for the sake of the church. And uh, in this case, He's saying, look, I'm the Father, the Holy Father. Yes, fathers don't resign. But I'm also the service of Orm Day. I'm the servant of the service of God. I can't serve like I ought. And he says in his beautiful uh, uh, statement, which, by the way, was in Latin, just like on April 20th, the first day after he was Pope, he gave a 22-minute address in Latin. Now he's ending it with an address in Latin. But he says, uh, I am well aware that this ministry, due to its essential spiritual nature, must be carried out not only with words and deeds, so the active life, but no less with prayer and suffering, as we saw in John Paul II. However, in today's world, subject to so many rapid changes and shaken by questions of deep relevance for the life of the faith, in order to govern the bark of St. Peter and proclaim the gospel, both strength of mind and body are necessary. And he realizes he's... he's very uh, sim simple and straightforward. He says, I'm getting weak. I can't, I can't keep doing this and serve the church like I should. So that was, am I surprised? No. Was it unexpected? Yes. In fact, did you hear any rumors? No, there were no rumors. I mean, this is one of the biggest things to ever happen without a single rumor that was ever surfacing before it happened. Right. I mean, the, to the extent that anybody talked about it, it was, it was kind of a theoretical thing. Yes. Nobody thought this was going to come when it did. And uh, that's something that's uh, notable. I mean, the Holy Father talks about, well, when things are serene, that might be a, may be a time. I don't think we could say things are serene. No. He talks about when the occupant of the papal office becomes incapacitated, judges himself unable to fulfill the obligations of the ministry, that might be the time. Um, one of the things that's kind of curious about this is this is just before Lent. Uh, there's very little time. Uh, he's, in fact, he announced the resignation today, but it's basically two and a half weeks off. Right. Does that tell us anything? Is there anything we can conclude about that? Well, I don't think he wanted to be a lame duck for a long period of time. Okay, uh, yeah, that makes sense. And I think that uh, Lent is a good time for prayer and fasting and asking for the grace of the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, follows, what follows Lent is Easter. So probably around Easter, we'll have a new pope. So he's liturgical. You know, he was born on Holy Saturday between the Easter Vigil 
uh, in Easter Sunday, between, excuse me, Holy Saturday, Easter Sunday morning, and uh, born and baptized on that same day in 1927. So I'm sure that was in his mind, at least subconsciously, that this would be a liturgical gesture too, that he would resign during Lent and let the prayer, the church go into prayer and fasting, uh, preparing for a new pope, and then the new pope would come at the time of the resurrection. There's going to be uh, a lot of assessment of Benedict. He's been pope for eight years, almost eight years. Yes. There'll be a lot of assessment of, of that pontificate, uh, and of course there'll be a lot of speculation about what's to come. Uh, obviously, you're going to be t you're going to be talking a lot of media venues over the next uh, couple of weeks. Let's let the Ignatius Press kind of get you know get ahead of the game here. Give us your assessment of the pontificate. My assessment of the pontificate. Yeah. Well, I think it you're was, completely objective. It was unbiased. a success before it began. Uh, I think because he brought with him all his rich past and especially his writings. And we at Ignatius Press we've published maybe 60, 70 books now. Uh, by Joseph Rasker, Pope Benedict XVI. So he brought his legacy with him. Uh, but certainly uh, he was a worthy successor to John Paul II. And I'm sure we'll have another worthy successor, except I do believe the time of giants is going to be over temporarily. Mm. We have some great cardinal candidates for Pope and maybe some ones we haven't heard of. There'll be kind of uh, surprises. But really, when you look at the intellectual uh, and the character, you know, strength and the character and the personality of these two popes, and we have had it good, folks, for this <laughs> last, you know, almost third of a century with these two popes. Uh, certainly, he's made a big difference in uh, liturgical matters with his motu proprio, his own book on the liturgy, and uh, writing his book on Jesus of Nazareth. That was an unusual thing for a pope to do. Uh, but uh, I, I think, all in all, those who love the church and traditions have to say, we've had a wonderful pope. Is that a good enough assessment? Yeah, well, that's, that's, what do you think, that's a, I, no, I You're think better that's, assessing things than I. I think that's a very good assessment. I, I, it's amazing to me, though, to think that he's done so much in, in eight years. You, we have conversations a lot about uh, state, state of the church, about bishops, and, and things that drive how bishops react to things. And we, we've both been pleased, I think, uh, about, uh, by many of the appointments of Benedict XVI and just the whole momentum that's been built up in these eight years. It's, it's incredible. That's true, and I think that is his biggest legacy has been uh, the appointment of bishops in these eight years, and having Cardinal Ouellette as prefect of the Congregation of Bishops for the last two and a half years has been a great blessing for the church. And we're from the West Coast, okay? Uh, we <laughs> yes. were very disappointed a couple of weeks ago when the Ravens beat the 49ers <laughs> in the Super Bowl. But you know, there's a thing called the West Coast Offense. Uh, which Bill Walsh, coach of the 49ers, and Joe Montana really brought perfection back in the 80s and early 90s. Uh, and that was kind of a consistent, uh, short passing, uh, running offense. And it really took over the whole NFL. It became kind of the model for the offense. Well, now we've got a new West Coast offense. So we just had a new archbishop named in Oregon, Bishop Sample. And now we've got Sartain in Seattle, Sample in, in Portland, Cordelione in San Francisco, Vasha in Santa Rosa, Gomez in, in Los Angeles, and we have uh, Flores in, in, San, uh, in, in San, Sac Diego. San Diego. So we now Soto have, in Sacramento. We, we, that's right, Soto in right. Sacramento. We, we now have the West Coast offense ready to go for the church. <laughs> well, we're going to need it. When you look at uh, all the cultural issues and all of the things that uh, challenges that the church faces, and I know We'll have a com we can have a conversation about the new evangelization. You're not so big on the new aspect of it. You just say, well, what yeah. is this evangelization? Yeah, right? just evang evangelization is fine, you know. But, but, but there certainly are challenges that the church has to face. And, and so we're moving a little bit from talking about assessing Benedict's uh, contribution to talking about his legacy, and that's looking forward in the future. I got an email from a friend this morning who is a little bit concerned about the extraordinary form liturgy. Now, we, we might say a little bit about what those terms mean for some of our viewers. Pope Benedict has been a major figure in facilitating a wider access to the old mass. Certainly, sometimes you hear it said that he's going back to the preconciliar liturgy, and that, that's not accurate. But my friend was concerned, well, where, where is it, what does this mean for people who are uh, committed to the extraordinary form? And we might ask the question, what does it mean for just the ordinary form of worship in the church? Well, we don't know the future, do we? Right. That's the problem. Uh, I doubt a new pope is going to suddenly retract uh, right. the motu proprio. 
And it was clear in Pope Benedict's introduction to that motor propria, there were two goals he had in mind. One was mutual reconciliation, or interior reconciliation, he said. Uh, not just the Pius X group with the Church of Rome, but rather the two forms of liturgy which had developed, the old and the new. Mm -hmm. he, he saw the new as it was experienced as a real break from tradition, and he wanted to have them mutually enrich each other. That was the second phrase, mutually enrich each other. So that's going to happen. And incidentally, uh, I know that Archbishop Corleone is planning here in San Francisco to establish a Benedict XVI Institute uh, for liturgy and music. Uh, and the Pope's resignation is a kind of appropriate time because the Pope wasn't that excited about something named after him. Right. Now maybe he won't be Pope anymore. He'll be willing to let that happen with a little more grace, you know. Liturgy, obviously, very important, and, and the Holy Father has contributed a lot to a, a reform of the reform. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about what that would look like. Uh, catechesis, uh, that's another area. That's an area which remains uh, in need of a kind of a shoring up. Um, how would you assess what Benedict's done in that area? How would you assess it? <laughs> how would I assess it? Well, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which we got from John Paul II, Joseph Ratzinger and Cardinal Schoenborn, they were the major players right. in that. Uh, that has helped immensely. You, we're in the catechetical business. We publish right. two catechetical series, and we know that the receptivity to those uh, programs has increased tremendously, and I think it's partly a, a result of the Catechism of the Catholic Church being out there, giving everybody a common sense of things. Uh, but I, the, the, for me, I see Benedict's contribution to catechesis being mainly through his appointment of bishops, because the bishops are the men who are going to be responsible for making sure the faith is communicated. And the seminaries produce the seminaries. good priests, and uh, they're taught well. I, I agree with you. You know, it's interesting, uh, you're too young, Mark, but I lived through the golden age of theologians, people like Congar and Boyer, de Lubac, von Balthasar, Ratzinger, Rahner. I mean, those are real giants in the middle of the 20th century, towards the end of the 20th century. We don't have real successes for them. Right. But we had John Paul II and, and Benedict who took the riches of that theology and really applied it catechetically, liturgically. And I think we have enough to live on for not several more decades. So we don't need a brilliant creative pope. If we get one, great. You know, the Holy Spirit is able to do wonderful things. But if we get someone who will simply carry on what's been begun by John Paul II and Pope Benedict, and especially an appointment of bishops, I think the church will be in a very strong position. Uh, you mentioned the, the passing of the age of giants. Pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict, were both men of the Second Vatican Council. They had extensive, they lived well before the council, they had theological formation and training before the council. And they were at the council. And they were at the council yeah. and they, they played a role in shaping the council. Of course, they were popes after the council. Is there a, is there a danger, and I guess you can look at this in lots of different ways, but is there a danger that uh, as we're moving from this period of time where the leaders of the church were men at the council to people looking back on the council, that they will have a distorted view of the age before and the age that followed? It's a possibility. I know this came to my consciousness a few years ago. I was talking to a young woman who was interested in the extraordinary form. And I said to her, and she's about 20 years old, 21, and I said, well, you weren't even alive when the council got over. And she said, Father, my parents weren't alive when the council got over. I thought, oh my gosh, the segment in council is a, it's history. Yeah, it's 50 and, years you know, ago. Uh, and there's very people now who live before the council for any length of time. I'm one of the few around, you know, there's a few of us. But uh, yeah, I, I think that the, the myth of the council and the myth, the worst myth of the pre-council times could have an influence, but I think Ratzinger and Benedict, excuse me, John Paul II, but especially Benedict, have done a great job of showing that the Second Vatican Council was not a break from tradition. It must be interpreted within tradition, and in fact, that's what Ratzinger said became, when he became Pope, uh, and he gave his first talk on April 20, 2005, that he's going to be a Pope of the Council, but he's going to reinterpret it according to tradition. So I think he's done that. And I think now we're, we're ready to uh, implement what he's begun. 
I want to ask you a question about uh, Ratzinger as theologian. Uh, you and I, we, we have these discussions from time to time, and we look at major figures in the church, and of course, von Balthasar is a big figure for you personally and for Ignatius Press as a publisher because we publish his works. Well, and for the church and for and the for world. And for the church and for the world, that's absolutely true. Um, and, and Ratzinger is this interesting fellow because he certainly knew the, the I'll call it, the, for lack of a better term, sort of the classical theological tradition leading up to the council. But uh, he wasn't indebted, or one might say held hostage by any particular theological school. Now we've seen this kind of, this effort to recover a sense of continuity with what came before the council. I'm wondering in theology, um, are, there, are there kind of dangers of kind of going back simply before the council and taking what happened there as if that were normative without any sense of, not just what the development the council brings to bear, but some of the limitations of theology before the council. Well, remember that the council itself was the fruit of a whole liturgical, biblical, and patristic movement of the early 20th century. And uh, precisely what was done before the council, immediately, and then at the council, was that the immediate tra uh, preceding tradition, which was neo-scholasticism, was reinterpreted in light of the fathers and especially the Greek fathers. So I don't think we're gonna undo that. Mm -hmm. I think that the way that Benedict unites the present with tradition is by accepting the good things that took place before the council, including neo-scholasticism, but also seeing those themselves as being an outgrowth of and a development of previous theology, especially the fathers and the great you know, medieval doctors. So yeah, I don't think we're gonna go back to uh, the kind of preconciliar merely scholastic theology we had. I, I think too much has been done by too many giants for that to happen. Oh, very good. Well, Father, uh, there's a lot that we can say about this. I'm sure over the next few weeks as things develop, we'll have an opportunity to talk more and see what, uh, what direction the Holy Spirit may be taking the church. Do you have any closing thoughts? Well, here's a thought. It's bad to close on, but uh, what do you think about St. Malachi's prophecy? <laughs> there's a famous prophecy right. of supposedly of the 12th century, although it may be a 16th century forgery, right. uh, where the St. Malachi gave the list of the next 112 popes. And uh, Benedict, the Gloria Olive, the glory of the olive, which is kind of hard to connect with him, but they do it, uh, is the second to the last. And his successor is supposed to be the last pope, Petrus Romanus, Peter the Roman. Well, we'll see. You know, Jesus told us we don't know the day or the hour. We must be ready at all times. But we'll be back with you to give you more updates on uh, this developing circumstance of a new pope. By the way, one, one thing I should, we should have said is that when was the last time this happened? Uh, 1415. With, we, talk, we, we did mention that, didn't we? With uh, uh, Gregory the Twelfth. So this is an unusual thing. It doesn't happen every century. Uh, and that, that was to end a schism in the church. That's right. Uh, so we, we hope that the next pope doesn't cause one, but That's right. <laughs> we don't think that will happen. We, Father Fessio, thank you for thank taking you, the Mark. time with us. All right.